So what if I told you that this reading from the Gospel of Mark that mentions divorce is actually a lesson about inclusiveness? What if I told you that today's reading that mentions adultery is actually a lesson for us about restorative justice? How can this be? I mean, clearly when the Pharisees corner Jesus and ask him about divorce, the answer is supposed to be about people excluding one another or being excluded one by the other and about punitive justice being the grounds for that exclusiveness. That may be an easy answer, but for Jesus, that is never the answer. For Jesus, the answer is always love. And love practices restorative justice. And love strives for the inclusiveness of communion. So here, Lily Tomlin might ask the Pharisees, if love is the answer, could you rephrase the question? The Pharisees ask Jesus about divorce. They ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? But let's make sure we get the phrasing of the question right. The King James Version of the Bible, one of the earliest translations, English translations of the Bible, first issued in, in 1612. The King James Bible, as it's also called, or as my, one of my seminary professors called it, the King Jimmy. It says, the Pharisees came to ask him, and they asked him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Why does it say that? Why doesn't it say divorce? In the King Jimmy, the Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Because the Greek word from which put away is translated is apoluo. And apoluo means to put away, to send away, or to dismiss. So, literally... The Pharisees aren't asking about divorce at all, yet our doctrinal understanding of divorce, largely informed by this text, has led to centuries of the Christian church punishing divorced people by excluding them from, literally and figuratively, the table of Holy Communion. We have some rephrasing to do. If love is the answer, you ancient translators of our Holy Scriptures, could you rephrase the question... But what if the Pharisees are talking about divorce? I mean, for some reason, the translation that we read today, the New Revised Standard Version of the text that we're reading, it says that word, so okay, let's entertain that possibility. David Loos is the president of Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and he says up front, we need to recognize that divorce in the first century was not at all the same phenomenon as it is in the 21st century. We need to recognize up front that in ancient times, a woman didn't divorce a man. Only a man could divorce a woman. And a man could do so for any reason. Deuteronomy 24, a man enters into marriage with a woman, but she does not please him because he finds something objectionable about her. And so he writes her a, certif a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. Divorce in antiquity was all about possessions. It was all about property and ownership, and women in that patriarchal society were property. Divorce in ancient times never left a scratch on a man. But it always left women destitute, without property, without options, forced to beg or go into prostitution. When the Pharisees confront Jesus, I hear him trying to put an end to this exclusionary practice. For one thing, the Pharisees ask Jesus about divorce, but he answers them about marriage. Let's rephrase the question, gentlemen. For another thing, if you're going to talk about marriage in that ancient context, you've got to talk about adultery, too. Back then, divorce could only be carried out by a man, and adultery could only be committed against a man. Adultery was an offense to a man's family lineage. It was an affront to a man's property and the continuance of his undefiled family name. 
That's all. And consequently, divorce was meant merely to protect a man's property and family name. That was the law. That has nothing to do with our 21st century Western world understanding of divorce. At least it shouldn't. So when Jesus responds to the Pharisees, he's responding to that ancient practice, not ours. And Jesus often does this. He, he flips that exclusionary, punitive practice on its head. Jesus says that a man divorcing his wife and marrying another is adulterous on the man's part. He's utilizing adultery to usher in restorative justice for past legalisms that caused women to be excluded. And Jesus' response to that legalistic exclusion was to say to patriarchal society, no, by putting her away and marrying another woman, you're committing adultery. And by committing adultery, you're sinning against her by dismissing her and casting her out into the margins of nothingness for your own benefit. You're sinning against her because she is not your property. She is a person who deserves your respect because she is fearfully and wonderfully made in the eyes of our God who loves us all. This is the same Jesus who is invited into the home of Simon the Pharisee. And when Simon and his male friends see this nameless woman in the story and try to exclude her by saying, if Jesus knew that she was a sinner, he wouldn't want to have anything to do with her. Jesus says, hang on, wait, hang on a second. Do you see this woman? Do you see her? The lesson for us among many that can be drawn from this text the lesson for us is that any practice that excludes someone's personhood and removes them from communion misses the mark. It's sinful. And do you see this woman? Do you see this person? Who are we excluding in our present day by being complicit to certain laws and doctrines and societal mores and ethics that are passively accepted? That's where the text finds us today. The bottom line is, when the Pharisees ask Jesus whether it's lawful for a man to put away his wife, they're testing him. Or as the King James Version says, they're tempting him. They don't really want an answer about how to look at things in a healthier way. They just want Jesus to mess up. It's a smear campaign. And the Sadducees do the same thing. They come to Jesus, and they corner him, and they ask him about... So what happens if a woman and a man are married and the man dies and then she gets remarried and then he dies and then she remarries? So who's her husband going to be in heaven? Because you've got to understand that ancient practice as well, that if a man dies, then his brother is obligated to marry the widow and so on and so forth. Stacy loves and adores my brothers. <laughs> But if something were to happen to me today, uh, she, that, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> so all their questions about divorce and marriage, they're not meant to make things better. They're meant to trip Jesus up and to preserve the exclusionary, punitive practices of their day. And every time Jesus is tested, every time he's tempted, his response seems to say, think about what you're asking and rephrase the question. Love is the answer. So let's talk about inclusion. Let's talk about restorative justice in everything that we ask. Now I've told you about my parents before. My mom got married when she was 19. And in her words, she got married because she thought it would solve all of her problems. And soon after that, she was divorced. My dad got married when he was very young as well. But his wife got sick with stomach cancer that was so aggressive that she never had a chance, and she died. So my mom and my dad, they grew up in grade school and high school, and they reconnected with each other. They fell in love, and they got married. And nine months later to the day of their wedding day, I was born. The Pharisees and the Sadducees might have questions for Jesus about my mom and about my dad and maybe even about me 
But my parents had a question of their own. Where are we going to go to church? Where are we going to be okay? Where is it going to be safe for us to raise a family? My dad, who identifies as Mexican-American, was raised in a Spanish-speaking Catholic church. My mother was raised third generation in First Baptist Church of Austin, and they decided that the church where dad grew up probably wouldn't embrace an interracial couple where one of them had been divorced. And so they attended First Baptist. I wonder to this day to what extent texts like these and our interpretation of them led to their decision. My parents were embraced at First Baptist, and that's the place where my two younger brothers and I were raised fourth-generation members. It's also the place where we learned that God is love. I never heard a sermon in that place preach exclusion or punishment. I never heard one way or the other how that church felt about the circumstances behind my parents' marriage. But what I always knew to be true is that they were loved, my parents, and that my brothers and I were loved, and that there was a place at the table for everyone in that house. And as I walk with Christ in my now married adult life of parenthood, I, I keep discovering that, that that's all that matters. God is love. That's the answer to everything. Today, I hear our Savior saying to those who would test him with trick questions, what I heard you say was, is it lawful for a man to put away his spouse? But I think what you meant to ask was, is it lawful for someone to utilize the powers granted to them by society to exclude someone else, to cast them out from the circle of opportunity, to dismiss them from the gifts of community and communion, and to banish them to the margins? Because if those things are lawful, you don't need to be questioning me. You need to be questioning your laws. Today, I hear our friend Jesus saying, if you're asking me whether it's acceptable for a panel of men to interrupt and talk over a woman before she has this chance to speak about her vocation simply because they disagree with her politically, then you don't need to be questioning me. You need to be questioning your societal mores that seem to still be living in the time of Moses. Today I hear our teacher Christ saying, if you're asking me whether it's just for a 26-year-old man to legally own 14 guns, six of which he carried with him during his shooting rampage, where he killed nine people in western Oregon in a community college on Thursday, you might want to rephrase the question and ask yourselves, instead of me, why do our ethics reflect more of a love of guns than a love of people. Because that question will more readily yield the only answer that matters. Love. Shall we pray? God of justice, mercy, and love, we recognize that the questions we ask about the state of things around us are often self-absorbed, often fearful. We thank you for sending Jesus into our midst to rephrase our questions. Challenge us, we pray, to ask questions of ourselves, of our neighbors, and our world, questions that promote the inclusion of all of your children's perspectives and even their very lives. As Jesus asked that the children be brought to him, may we strive for laws and doctrines and mores and ethics that seek to bring all of your children from the margins of fear to the center of your fold where there is empowerment for all, safety for all, appreciation and respect for all, room for all. We pray these things in your many names. Amen.